Welcome to another episode of Cocktails with Bright Antenna. This week, we're coming to you live in front of a sold-out audience at the Sweetwater Music Hall in Mill Valley, California. Tonight, we'll be talking to the author of a new graphic novel about the one and only Jeff Buckley. And we'll be joined by a very special guest, Jeff's mom, Mary Goubert. We'll also be capping it all off with a musical tribute to Jeff Buckley's music from an array of artists, including the legendary Wayne Kramer. So enough with this intro. Let's talk about and celebrate Jeff Buckley. (laughs) All right. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Cocktails with Bright Antenna podcast. Uh, We have a very special episode this evening um, for you out there uh, just listening. You're like, that doesn't sound like Tiffany, the usual host. (laughs) And that is because it is not. It is Scott, also from Bright Antenna. Uh, A little switch tonight in that Tiffany is actually the special guest, along with Mary Goubert. And we'll get to who that is in a second. Pardon the interruption, but I never actually get to that. Mary Goubert, as stated in the introduction, is Jeff Buckley's mom. But um, we are here to talk about... um, a book, Jeff Buckley, Grace, the story, the Jeff Buckley story. The Jeff Buckley story. There we go. Thank you. It's a team effort up here, people. It's <laughs> it all is good. It's a team effort. Yeah. Um, so, Grace, the Jeff Buckley story, which uh, Tiffany wrote the text for. And we're going to talk a lot about that. And then later on this evening, we have a slew of amazing musicians that it's, it's, it's going to be very special. I was here for sound check. It's going to be awesome. So um, we're just going to jump right in here, and I'm going to start with Tiffany. Uh Tiffany's also, for those of you who don't know, she is my wife. So if we... Allegedly. Allegedly. (laughs) Allegedly we sleep together. So if there's strange remarks that seem not right, that's probably why. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But Tiffany, let's... So the book just came out today, which is amazing. All very exciting. It's been a long process. Congratulations. Congratulations to both of you. Mary was very involved in the process, and we'll get to that as well. But um, at first, Tiffany, I think we just want to start and get a, a brief synopsis of like you discovering Jeff and like some of the magic that happened early in, in your journey with Jeff that led you to Mary. Okay, well, I'm going to try and tell this story as quickly as possible because it's actually a long story, but... Um, I mean, I think everyone who knows me knows I'm a, an obsessive Jeff fan. Um, and how I discovered Jeff's music was in 1999. I actually never knew Jeff's music when he was alive. Um, and in 1999, Chris Cornell put out a solo record called Euphoria Morning, and there was a song on it. Yeah, it's a great album. Um, and it's, there's a song on it um, called Preaching the End of the World, and there was a line in the song that inspired... Um, a, a, an idea for a story for me. And so I, I wrote the line um, on my computer and I started writing what I thought was going to be a short story. And, um, and then I read an article where Chris was talking about the album and he talked about his friend Jeff Buckley who was an inspiration for a few of the songs on the album. And so because I loved the album so much, I went out and bought this album that he was talking about And the night I bought the record, I didn't listen to it, but I had a very strange dream. I don't think I've ever even told you this story, but I had a very strange dream where I was sitting at this kitchen table and Chris was sitting on one side of me and Jeff was sitting on the other and they couldn't speak to each other and I had to talk to them for them. And so Chris would say to me, tell Jeff, blah, 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 blah. And I would look at Jeff and tell him and Jeff would say, tell Chris, blah, 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 blah. And this... This was the dream. And so um, so the next day, Scott and I were flying to Italy, and I brought the cassette to put in my Walkman. On her s- yellow sports Walkman. <laughs> yes, this was 1999. Um, and Scott and I were flying to Italy at the time, actually, to find a place to get married. And we're halfway over America, and I put the, the tape in my Walkman, and Scott's sound asleep, and the first few notes of Mojo Pin, all the hair starts standing up. Oh my God, I'm gonna get get emotional already. Um, I know it's too early to cry. Um, And I just, it was a voice that spoke to me in a way that I I hadn't heard a voice do that to me in a really long time, probably since I was 11 and I heard Bono for the first time. (laughs) Um, And 
by the time I got to Lover, You Should Have Come Over, I was crying hysterically, and Scott woke up, and he was like... I was like, what, what, what's going on? Is there something wrong with the plan? Are we going down? Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and I said, I took the earphones off as, I'm, as tears are streaming down my face. I was like, you have to listen to this song right now. And in my head, I said, if he doesn't like this song, we're not getting married. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a big sign. <laughs> And luckily, I like the song. Luckily, he liked the song. And so <laughs> anyway, that's, that's, and, and, and I continued writing that story, that book. It, the short story turned out to be my first novel, God Shaped Whole. And Mary somehow got a hold of that book. And well, let, let's, let's, uh, just, let's just stay on that just a little bit. And okay. the next part of that is after you finish the book and you're in New York City and you see a, an article in the Village Voice or something like, or Time Out, one of those, doesn't matter. Okay, so I, I, I also, I'm, I, I'm basically one of those people that feel like music saved my life. So um, I read this article about this charity organization that uses music to help kids in recovery. And it's called Road Recovery, and I think like, wow, like I, I wanna help them, I believe in that. And so I call the number, and this goofy guy answers the phone, and he's and I say, you know, I, I'd I'd love to volunteer for you guys. I live part time in New York, and um, I really believe in what you're doing. And he's like, okay, okay, well, well, we need all the help we can get. We're a grassroots organization. That's my Jack impress impression. Um, <laughs> oh, Jack, yes, yeah. Oh, no. he's like, Frenetic. Yeah, like come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, tip, really tip, bad. come on down, come on down tomorrow. Yeah, we really need that. <laughs> so he tells me, come, come down and meet us tomorrow, and we can talk. And um, so I show up to their office, which is actually his apartment, um, <laughs> his very, very hoarder, hoarder apartment on the Upper West Side. Probably not bigger than this stage. <laughs> no, and I walk in, and yeah. keep in mind, I'd spent a year writing this book obsessed with grace, listening to grace over and over again and writing this book. And I walk into their office and there are pictures of Jeff everywhere. And so I was just like, uh, okay. <laughs> and, and Gene, the guy who runs the organization, comes up to me and says, oh, he sees my reaction. He's like, you a Buckley fan? And I was like, well, you can say that. I just spent a year writing a book inspired by his music. And he said, well, I was Jeff's manager, road manager. Road manager. Road manager. So, um, so there yeah. you have it. Somehow that led me to Mary. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> Mary, where, where did you first learn of Tiffany? So this is within a year or so of, of Jeff's passing, right? So he passed in 97. Probably two years, yeah. Right. And I was in New York working on uh, sketches for my sweetheart, The Drunk, and other things. And Jean called me, and let me just say that during this time, there were several individuals who were sort of on the line of, of a stalker of Jeff's, like, like Uber fans. For example, one woman contacted uh, somebody who interviewed me, a newspaper person, and he forwarded a letter, a four-page letter that she claimed that she had contacted Jeff and found a man online who could perform a seance during which they could call Jeff's soul forward and impregnate her with my grandchild. Well, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> that's just one example. So, so that's the background for when Jean called and said, Mayor, this super Jeff fan has written a book based <laughs> inspired by his music, and she's got to meet you. How hard did your eyes roll? <laughs> so I said, let's pick a street corner. <laughs> we did. I we said, let's pick a street, street corner. I don't know. Let, no, I don't, know, I don't even know if I want to meet her in a restaurant. <laughs> okay? Just, just have her meet on a street corner, and I'll see how I feel about her and we'll go from there. So literally, do you remember what street it was? I feel like it was Houston somewhere and something. in Tribeca. Yes, it you was were in staying Tribeca. in Tribeca. Dwayne it Street and Broadway or something near, like that. Uh, what was the venue that used to be down there where Jeff used to play? Oh, that was Knitting Factory. Yes, it was near there. <laughs> right. So <laughs> up walks this angel. Oh. And um, You don't know her as well as I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found about the devil part later. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, but I, then she, you know, I, I read the book. I was 
moved and impressed and thought that this young person had a real through line into what, how a soul works through pain and how we work through the things that sometimes feel like they're going to destroy us or that we'll destroy ourselves just to get out of the pain. And, um, and I thought, well, this is really an insightful young woman. I really enjoyed the way she wrote, the, the things that she described, the way she used words. All of that was so very impressive. I thought, this is, a, this is really kind of a special person. So 10 years ago, when um, the publisher, Mark Siegel, approached me, who was also a Jeff Buckley fan, um, he had just been handed, given a footprint, a publisher, Macmillan Press said, we like what you, you're, art, you're an artist, you're a graphic artist who's amazing. We think you should be the head of a separate footprint for graphic novels and graphic children's books. So brand new publisher of his own with his own footprint up at the, the uh, Flatiron building. He's on the top floor, right? Very cool office. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. totally. He let me go out on the balcony. He let me go out there where the wind blows like uh, a Quasimoto. <laughs> it was really amazing. Um, anyway, so he approached me with this idea of creating a story that wasn't exactly a biography, that would involve uh, characters that, that would help tell a story but were never really true characters. That somehow we could meld Jeff's true life story with other characters that would make it a story not just about his life but about how his music impressed others and created songwriters and, and creative people from his inspiration. And that's when it started. Then Pascal Dizen started sending me sketches and from time to time I'd get new panels. And in the beginning he looked kind of like Junkhead, Jughead, Jughead. right? Jughead, Jughead with the ski nose and the flowing hair. And I thought, no, yeah, no, that's, no. It has to be more painterly. I want you to... You know, I understand that graphic uh, uh, depictions can kind of make people's faces do funny things and you need a way to, to portray certain emotions and reactions. And when he started doing some of the pages that showed Jeff in the thralls of uh, musical, his own music mm -hmm. process, I thought, okay, this kid can do this. So. So, but Tiffany was, when you first, so you suggested Tiffany to the publisher. Yes, that he said who would write this. And, and there was the only publisher, one name that came The up. publisher then reaches out to Tiffany, and Tiffany's initial reaction is? I've never read a graphic novel before. I can't write one. <laughs> she doesn't want to write it. Not at well, all. Well, I, I felt like I couldn't do it justice. Like, to me, I, I would never want to get involved in a project about Jeff that didn't do him justice. So I think I was terrified. And I just said no. <laughs> and what changed that for you? And why did, well, how were you able to like, get well, past that fear? I mean, I think you changed it for me because you really, you said. And for those of you just listening, by you, Tiffany means Mary, not Scott slash me. You know, I, you said you believed that I could do it. And you said, you'll come to Los Angeles. You'll spend a month with me. We'll go through everything. And I. I couldn't say no to that. And then Mark Siegel gave me about 30 graphic novels and said, here, take these home and read them. You'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that easy. Yeah. <laughs> and we just worked through it page by page. I mean, you literally have a big uh, format, large format picture sent to you of the drawings. And you can say, oh, no, that's, no, that he doesn't look at all. I don't like the way that's happening. For example, there's one moment in the story where Jeff has to tell Hal Wilner that he's, he's just got the phone call to go to the tribute, and he has to remember somehow graphically for the reader that he was not invited to the funeral, that he'd only seen his father for a very brief period of time, and that this tribute, if he could bring himself to do this, would be his first and only opportunity to pay respect to his father. I'm so holding this up for the camera, yes, by the way. So, oh, for the camera. Yeah. So <laughs> what we did was we had him sit still as himself in the present 
and then made all the drawings in his mind around him of the face of his childhood and his father walking through the door and all of those things. And you still have Jeff sitting in silence here thinning, thinking with the phone in his ear. So those panels that described everything that was going through his mind without, it, without a voice, you know, without a little bubble for his words, that to me was really powerful, that there are so many panels here where you just really get it out of the art and not... So, but the art took a while, right? Oh, boy. I mean, it was <laughs> well, a process. Years. It was a process, <laughs> 10, ten years. Yeah. That's yeah, the text was done. Yeah. The text, the text was done. Uh, to the point where we thought, like, this book is never coming out. So it was, well, I guess, because you were kind of involved, you were kind of involved in the process of the revisions of the drawing, so you were kind of familiar right. with it. So I knew something was happening, but there was still months yeah. in between. I guess Pascal might have been doing, doing something else for a living, <laughs> yes. you know, to so make actual I, money. I assume you were very <laughs> happy between. with it. I'm sure you're happy with the way the drawings Oh, ultimately absolutely. Ended up. In fact, my favorite page is the one where it's just Jeff's face, and it has uh, the little admonition on the side. Mm. Here, let me show you. Okay, you can look through that. And in the meantime, so Tiffany, it's like eight, ten years from when you wrote the text and you think it's dead and suddenly it shows up in your inbox and it's done. Like, what was your reaction to reading it and seeing the artwork? Well, it, for me, because so much time had passed um, and I hadn't seen all of the artwork, so when I, when I actually saw the PDF of the entire book done, um, it was like reading a book that I had no part of. It was, it was like reading it for the first time. And it moved me so much that I thought, well, OK, if, if I know what's going to happen and it moves me, then I think maybe it will move other people too. So this is, yeah. this is the page that I would love to see turned into a wall poster. So it has just that picture of Jeff. And this is from a little piece of paper that fell out of one of his books. Remember, be the best. No negativity, no weakness, no acquiescence to fear or disaster, no errors of ignorance, no evasion from reality. So, you know, I'm putting his, that was packing Jeff. his books up and that piece of paper fell out. And that's how he spoke to himself, right? No fear, don't avoid the truth. And that is how he processed his work, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And his life, too. There was no separation between the two. Well, and I think that's, I mean, you, you brought up the little point that fell out of the book, but that's something special to me that was in the book itself. There's a bunch of little snippets from his journal that are actually word for word, right, yeah. that are from his journal. Um, it's not his handwriting, although he did, the artist did a very good job of interpreting it, it, right? Yes. Which I thought, I mean, was that an intentional choice on your fault, part, it, Tiffany? I su definitely suggested that because Jeff had a very unique, beautiful handwriting Printing, cool. really. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, lefty. Lefty. Like oh, me. Lefties. <laughs> <laughs> lefties in the How audience. Many lefties do we have in the house? <laughs> the chosen ones. It's a thing, it's a brain thing, right? If Obama were here, he'd rise his right? hand, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a right hander that loves left handers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so what, in, in researching the book, Tiffany, what surprised you the most about when you were reading his journals and all that sort of thing? What like, came to you that you did not expect? Um, well, I, I don't know if I expected or didn't expect it, but I, I feel like, um, first of all, that I think people often have this idea that Jeff was like this brooding, serious, like, sad person and his journals are hilarious and goofy and fun and he just had I mean what I see is that he had this spirit that was so full of light and love and he he was conscious of it and he focused on that and he wanted to like be a presence in the world that was light and love and that was really moving and inspiring to me um, and I think that's why people are so drawn to his music still, because they hear that. They hear his spirit in his music, and that's what it is. It's just light and love and no negativity, no fear, being the best. You know, he was so focused and thoughtful about the way he approached life that um, it was really special to, to read about and write about. 
Wow. I learned yeah, a lot from, wow. from reading his journals. <laughs> um, well, when someone like that, who has that philosophy, enters the world that he bravely entered, that really, he, by his own admission, by his own assessment, was really not made for him. He, he, in an interview he once said, you know, there were people who would just give, you know, a left body part to have the acclamation that he had from his first album. And he said, you know, that really doesn't mean anything to me, the, the critics and, and all of that, because for him that process, the most important part was the connection he had with his audiences. When he showed up in France and they were singing the words to his song the first time he ever showed up, freaked him out. <laughs> you people are crazy. <laughs> and they're singing, you know. To him, he was just this little guy walking through the earth doing the only thing he could do, the only thing he was born to do, and loved other musicians, loved, adored, worshipped the other musicians who came into yeah, his Yeah, the life. styles he references are yeah. just all over the board. Right. And one of the people he admired was Wayne Kramer of the MC5, Ooh. who is with us Who's tonight. Who's going to be here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Kick Out the Jams was his best. Was, it was his go-to encore. Yep. Right? I think one. we have one version somewhere of one of the live concerts where he went on for about 20 minutes. <laughs> Sony loved that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> well, um, they, they, they came to him and said, you know, can't do kangaroo. Can't do kick out the jams. It's just, you know, we don't know. So Jeff made it. So he went there with his own suits in the audience in Europe. He just said, oh, yeah, now we're going to do them back to back, <laughs> motherfucker. And then he grew mustaches to yeah. further piss them off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then he grew the mustache. <laughs> because they put him in People's Most Beautiful People magazine. <laughs> and he hated it. There he was standing between two pillars with his V-neck t-shirt, right? <laughs> his blonde hair blowing in the wind. And as soon as he saw that, he dyed his hair black. <laughs> he did, and he didn't wash it anymore. <laughs> I said, why are you uglifying yourself, honey? <laughs> he said, did you see the People magazine? <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, and around that time, he's trying to write his second album. He's having a lot of trouble, and it's it's you know it's sort of that it's already hard to write a second album after the first one. And then he just has all this extra pressure. Well, the Sony but, wanted another Grace, right? And but, he was not which they there. didn't want in the first place, of course. Four years of touring, yeah. he was done. Yeah, with Grace. But at, at one point, when he's going through this process, when he's trying to figure out what he wants to say and what he wants to write, he says. Uh, my mom raised me to know myself. What was your approach to doing that? Good question. Well, when you're smart enough to know that you've given birth to a phenomenon, you know that you just don't want to fuck it up. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, pre no pressure. <laughs> Thank you. It seemed obvious to me at the time, but you know, the parenting issue in the 70s and, and <laughs> 60s and 70s was like, oh, my God, you, you had to hover and you had to do this and, and form your child. And, you know, all of that was your responsibility. And, I, and this little boy came to me with this amazing presence and personality, and he, and he was already singing songs at two, you know. I could sing harmony while he was singing when he was six. So... This was phenomenal. I was a musician already. I knew that this kid was really going to be very talented. And if I kept out of his way, he would be exactly who he needed to be. Mm. And I think if I ever did anything right in my life, that's one thing I did do. Cheers to that. Yeah. Excellent. Clap into that. I take credit for doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Tiffany, any advice for aspiring graphic novelist yeah, writers? Writers, authors. What? Just <laughs> write. Just that. do it. No, I don't Just know. Just do it. <laughs> Read this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> don't be afraid. Don't be yeah. afraid. I guess. I mean, be the or, best. No, everyone's afraid all the time. It's going forward despite the fear. I think that's the real advice. Well, and I think maybe that's what New York did for Jeff. 
because I have to tell you, if you haven't been to New York, there's a lot of people doing some really weird shit out there, <laughs> and people are <laughs> applauding it. They show up for these art exhibits and, and live, you know, uh, uh, performance, performance art. And th so he, he, in that environment, he kind of said, you know what? I think I can be whoever the fuck I want to be. Right <laughs> here. And then when you can be that in a certain place, you can take it wherever you go. Because that is who you are. You know, through my life, I've been criticized for being too much, right? Too emotional, too uh, this, too that. I knew the Bette Midler song. And I finally decided, after Jeff died, I, it was a sh such a shift in my own consciousness of myself and my <coughs> impermanence and the impermanence of what we're involved in here on this planet that I decided to just be myself. <laughs> And I've loved life so much more ever since then. Living life without Jeff is tough enough. Mm. Without having to be what I was afraid other people needed me to be or wanted me to be or thought I should be. So that when I do the work with Jeff's stuff, you know it's all been thought out. And it's all been done in such a way that I can look at myself in the mirror. And I go to sleep at night and I sleep well. And I know that when I see Jeff again, he will be proud of me. Mm. Word. <laughs> um, and I was actually, well, you kind of answered all my questions, but <laughs> so I'll just let that one slide. <laughs> but um, Tiffany, after doing all this research and, you know, meeting and talking with Mary, and you know, what sort of, did you take away any uh, life lessons from, I guess, your study of Jeff? Um, I mean, I, I feel like I kind of already addressed that, which, sorry. Okay, well, then never <laughs> but, mind. You um, guys don't get to know. No, I mean, I think, I think just his spirit and the way he approached life, no negativity, no fear, like that kind of thing, that really resonated with me on a deep, deep level. And, um, you know, I think <coughs> the other thing about, like, my connection to Jeff's work is that you know, I told the magical story earlier, but also so many people came into my life um, during that time because of their love for Jeff's music that brought us together, like some of my closest friends um, and people that, you know, I've been been close with ever since. And so... At least one will be playing bass later yes. tonight. Yes, Race, where are you? In here yeah, somewhere. Exactly. Somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think... It's just like there's so much I have so much gratitude for everything that Jeff has brought to my life um, with his music. And that's that's the most important thing to me. That's awesome. Amazing. Um, anything else you guys would want to say about the experience or the process or writing the book or working with each other? Oh, yeah. What's a good story about working with each other? Come on. <laughs> I mean, we didn't Sitting have any the really good table, stories. Just, you just, guys were just like we didn't get into any trouble. The work, was, <laughs> the work was done on the phone. The fun was meeting her and getting together and actually having a friendship. Yes, uh, and wine. So was, a yes, lot of wine. Lots of wine. Yes. I remember sitting at the outside at the Chateau Marmont with lots of wine. Whispering angels. <laughs> <laughs> Whispering angels. But no, I, I do want to give Mary... Um, some extra love because I think she she has a lot on her, her shoulders and she's she's brought Jeff's legacy to a place where I think he would be so proud of her and she's a force to be reckoned with and I'm really honored to work with her and so proud to know her so I just want to say thank you to her for bringing me along on this journey. And Allison, too. Allison. Allison. And for those of you who can't see this, Mary and Tiffany are pointing to Allison in the audience. Big thanks to Allison, too. <laughs> Allison is Jeff's cousin, and she works with me. We are, we are Jeff Buckley, Inc. The two <laughs> there were she two holds amazing my hanky women up for here. me, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only um, women can rule the world. <laughs> we will. We're on our way right now, right? <laughs> right on. <laughs> so... Here's the, so I, I give this speech. Are there how many musicians and artists of any kind are there in the audience? 
A lot. Okay. So just because this is what I, this is my preach, this is my little sermon that I give to artists and people out there, you are the goose that lays the golden egg. And there are probably 10 people with their hands cupped around your ass to catch that thing before you get a taste. Please understand that there's a reason for you to understand your business as a business. You are a manufacturer of something precious and wonderful. And you need to be aware that there are too many people in the, in the industry of this world who will want to take all of the bites of that golden egg before you get a piece. So what we want to do moving forward is to create an awareness in the government for a special pathway for artists to be able to keep more of what they make and to be able to make a living for the rest of their lives based on the art that they work. So you need to own your own work. Do not sign the fuckers away, okay? And you need to know that you're a business and understand. I know your heart is in art, but your head needs to understand that you need to make a living and you should be making it before somebody else with a suit where it is. That's my only word. Lection. Excellent. Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I think, unless you want to quickly tell the wedding story you wanted to tell. A no, little that's more. fine. Okay. No, anyway. it's fine. Let's take questions, yeah. if ever, anyone. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> wedding story. Well, it was just a story about hallelujah, because we walked down the aisle to hallelujah, and um, we... We, I have two sisters, Scott has two sisters, and so they each got a verse, and so they would walk the, uh, each verse down the aisle, and I'm standing back in the back with my dad, and he's listening to the music as it's going, and he looks at me and he says, this is a beautiful song, who is this? And I said, Dad, it's Jeff Buckley, who I have men had mentioned to him 7,000 times. Um, and he, he looks at me and he goes, well, when did he get here? <laughs> but then the next thing he said to me is he looked at me and dead serious goes, just say the word and we're out of here. No. And I am his favorite. Sorry, Don and Chad. <laughs> just kidding, Don and Chad. I actually have no idea if I'm the favorite. It probably just depends on the day. I was the first daughter to get married. It was traumatic for him. Anyway. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> um... One, one, we're going to open it up to questions here soon, but because it is Cocktails with Brian and Ted, I just want to say uh, kudos to Josh back there at the bar who created Cheers. these special lilac, lilac margaritas for the night in Thank honor you. of Jeff. The uh, ingredients and listings will be in our information on the podcast later. Yeah, uh, Scott asked me if there was a cocktail that Jeff enjoyed the most. He was not a cocktail drinker. He was mostly a Guinness and French red wine drinker. But there was a very famous night at the Green <laughs> Mill in Chicago that involved Jose Cuervo. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So Sounds like we trouble. decided to commemorate that night tonight and make a lilac margarita. So that was I'm my moving idea. on to my yes. second one, so look out. <laughs> it's going to be a fun night. Um, so, yeah, let's open it up for questions. And how this is going to work is... Whoever can ask questions will call on you, and then I'll repeat it so people on the podcast can hear it. Uh, so, questions. The question is, oh which graphic novels did you use to get a handle on the medium? Okay, well, I don't really remember a lot of them because it was a decade ago, but um, there was one particular one that was a woman had written um, set in the Middle East. I can't remember the name of it, but it was really, really good. <laughs> Yes. The man in the audience correctly identified the graphic novel as Persepolis. And there was a sequel to it that was also very good. Yes. That's so the, one. the publisher is first, second books. You need to look them yeah, up. They're awesome. Yeah. Okay. More questions? Anyone? They'll answer anything up here, I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. Oh. We like to talk about sex. question. Uh, so the question is uh, that Jeff was a big Morrissey Smiths fan, and what influences did Mary turn Jeff on to, though? So we had swapping tapes. We would, 
I would send him tapes of classical stuff, <laughs> and he would send me lo Yo La Tengo. <laughs> or, or Beastie Boys. Or, um, oh, Pat Boone singing punk rock. I have the, he sent oh, me the amazing. album. So, uh, you know, and, and not only that, but the first time he sent me his tapes from like, when he was still living in LA, and I heard some of the early versions of, of Strawberry Street and Eternal Life, and I thought to my, oh, there was another one called Radio that was like this totally angry, screaming thing. And I thought to myself, oh, fuck, what if I don't like his music? That was just the early stuff, right? But that, but that was a, there was a moment in time when I thought, oh no, this is not going to work out so well. <laughs> um, but I was a classically trained piano player, so my stuff was, you know, my er and Barbara Streisand. Okay, so and lots of Joni. I bought every Joni album ever, ever, ever. So, uh, so that was me, right? The 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 Edith Piaf and the, the Twelfth of Never, those old Judy Garland songs. That, those were my influence going that way. And then, the, and then he would send me the, the headbangers coming this way. <laughs> nice. Oh, question back there, yes? Oh, you're beautiful. Aww, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, first, uh, the gentleman, I'm sorry, what is your name? Alex. That's Alex. Alex. Oh, Alex. Okay, I couldn't see on the lights. You know him. I do. We know him. <laughs> so, first, he, uh, for all of you listening at home, and we're sorry you're not here, accurately uh, assess that this is a very special night with a very special crowd. So, and thank you guys all for coming. Woo! Woo! Um, but the question is, uh, did, were the, has there been any weird use requests for Jeff's music, whether it's a Subaru commercial or maybe a condom ad, who knows? Okay, so Allison is the person, she owns a company called Stay Golden Music, and she's the person who handles all of the placements and things like that. Oh yeah, see, we, no, we don't do, we don't do those things. Yeah. Yeah. That's weird. So this is, <laughs> this is they wanted to spend how much, Allison? $250,000 to use Hallelujah in a Dodge truck commercial. <laughs> All right? Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, th they, people don't know that that song is just about sex. <laughs> they play it at baptisms, <laughs> funerals, <laughs> high school recitals. <laughs> weddings is okay. Weddings it's about sex, sense. okay? It's good for weddings. <laughs> you used to show it me worked. down below, and now you, you know, what? What? <laughs> I mean, and I'm watching as my little Willits High School choral group comes up and sings Hallelujah. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm looking around at the parents. And they're just gazing up at their children singing. I'm thinking, do you know they're talking about fucking? Do you? <laughs> do you know that that's what he's talking about? No, that's they don't. Awesome. They don't know. I love, no, no. And it's too bad that Leonard, uh, R.I.P., does not own, did not own that song for the last 10 years of his life because oh. his former manager had absconded with all of his money to the Caribbean. Goes back to what you were saying earlier. Right? Yeah. And Sony ATV, his publisher, purchased the first 10 years of his work. Wow. So Bird on a Wire, all of that, now belongs to Sony ATV, including Hallelujah. So the, when somebody comes and says, can we use Jeff's you know, Hallelujah, Sony owns the master rights. I don't own the song rights. It better be something fucking special. 
mm-hmm. or I'm not going to let them use it. <laughs> There's other people who will sing it. There's other people who have, have sung it and recorded, Katie Lang and so many other people, that if it's going to be my son's voice behind whatever is going on on the screen, it better be something rich and wonderful and, and worthy of his voice. And then, you know, it's not like I'm depriving them of the song in any way. It doesn't belong to me, but... Do we owe you money for the wedding song? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, we have time for one more question, so now is the time, if you've got it. We're, oh, there you are. Okay. You know how Jeff talked about Mel Tolling. How do you feel about contemporary like Tom Waits and Van Morrison? Um, the question is, how did Jeff feel about contemporaries like John, Tom Waits and Van Morrison? They were his heroes. And as often as he performed Van Morrison's work, it, it, he would, there was something about the spirit of the songs and the, and the direction that they took, it, lyrically and, and vocally, that, uh, that kind of resonated with him. So he, he did quite a few. And then, because of the, the challenge of the playing the guitar at the same time, I mean, in the Shanae sessions, there's a, there's a version of uh, The Way Young Lovers Do that just rips, yes, Ast- from Astral Weeks, that just rips the sky apart. So that very important. He was I very much. Oh, Zappa. Okay, so here's my little story about the mothers of invention. <laughs> I was married to Tim Buckley. People think I had Jeff out of wedlock or something, but I was actually <laughs> married to him. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was looking for a manager, and J- Jimmy Fielder, who was our uh, uh, bassist said, well, I'm, I'm teaching uh, guitar lessons with this drummer who's playing with a group called Them Others. Them Others. Them, Them Others. others. <laughs> and he said, well, w- they're performing at this club next to the trip. You should come down. Oh, no, it was at the trip. So we got in the, <laughs> in the car, drove to Sunset Boulevard on a Tuesday night, and out came Herb Cohen, the manager of the mothers, and he became Jeff's manager, Mm. okay? So at one point, we had moved out of our apartment in Anaheim because we couldn't afford to pay the rent, and I moved in with Herb, and Tim moved in with uh, Jimmy in another apartment. And Herb came came to my bedroom, I'm babysitting his children and all of that, came to my bedroom one night and he said, hey, get dressed, we need you. I get my clothes on, we get in the car with Herbie, we drive to a place called Sunset Sound, it's a very famous old uh, studio on Sunset, and he walks me through the back door, and I'm coming through the aisles, and I'm looking at these rooms with a little glass, and a lot. he takes me into a room with a reel-to-reel recorder, a headset, a thermos of coffee, and a tuna fish sandwich, and a keyboard. And he said, look, Frank could do these, che- these lead sheets, but he just doesn't have time. So I put the headsets on, and the first track I'm doing now, I'm going to be writing lead sheets. I'm going to be taking musical dictation, right, for every note on this graph paper that we have here. And the first song is Call Any Vegetable. (laughs) And after that was Susie Cream Cheese, (laughs) right? So I went through the whole album, and I did all the lead sheets for that. And I was 17 years old, but I knew enough about music to be able to hear the note and then take it like musical dictation. So I wrote the lead sheets for fucking Frank Zappa. (laughs) Woo! And mic drop number two. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) All right, so um, we're gonna call it uh, this situation. We're done. We're gonna take five or 10 minutes to switch over to the music uh, part of the evening. And like I said earlier, hold on. Yeah. It's gonna be good. So, all right. Thank, thank you, guys, you guys so much for being here. Oh. Um, first up, we have uh, Eli Carlton Pearson. Did I say that right? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Woo! Yeah, that's me. He uh, teaches songwriting, actually, at Marin Horizon School. And he has also got a Kickstarter going with his band PSDSP. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, to record a new album. So go look that up. Support him. And with him is Vanessa Pritchard, coming all the way from New Zealand. 
And uh, she also does a very badass cover, uh, acoustic cover of Pony's Genuine. Correction, that's Genuine's Pony, not Pony's Genuine. So maybe she can rip that out later. Throwback. But anyway, take it away, guys. Thank right you. On.
Thanks, y'all. Well, it does go without saying that it's, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be asked to, uh, to perform a Jeff Buckley tune. This stuff goes pretty deep into uh, Vanessa and my consciousness for a long time. I know Alex Lassus is in the audience, and he's the first cat that, that bumped Grace after yeah. a long hike, and it, it fully, fully blew my mind. So um, this is a hell of a a long uh, circle to be completing and be on the stage performing. Um, and thanks, Tiffany DiBartolo, for, uh, for thinking to throw such a thing and thinking to do such a thing. And this is, this is really rad. So, and Mary and, and, and everyone and anyone who came out. Um, so um, we're actually going to do an, one other tune that we realize actually shares some, uh, some genetic information with this tune, being in 6-8 and having, having definitely some thematic stuff in common. I won't say any more about it. Vanessa wrote it. Yeah, She's I wrote this song. Yeah. <laughs> and this is Vanessa Pritchard, y'all. Give it up, give it up. Thank you. Shall we? Yeah, the guitar tuners are on strike, so we just do it <laughs> ourselves now. Exactly. Are you ready? I think I am. Yeah. Okay, I'm not because it's okay.
Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much for listening. And we're going to pass the stage on to Brad Brooks and Adam Rossi now. This is Vanessa Pritchard. A Google search will produce some music. I have a website, and you can come to me to find out more about it. Yeah. And PSDSP, if you can remember that acronym, will get you a little closer to what I'm up to these days. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Love you guys. Please give it up for Eli and Vanessa. Oh, 
and the tears we cry dried on yesterday. Civil fools will part for us. There's nothing in our way, my love. you see you're just a torch to put the flame to all our guilt and shame and now rise like an ember in your name I know everybody wants you Thank you. Um, I want to say again tonight, too, thank you so much to uh, Tiffany and, and Mary and Scott for putting this on tonight. Um, Jeff's music means a lot to me and to all of us here tonight. And um, this is, you know, I'm just, I'm having a great time. I hope you guys are, too. Um, this is a song of mine. Um, I went through a major health issue uh, four years ago. I went through some throat cancer. And um, uh, things are doing great. Uh, but um, uh, I went through a very dark part of my life. And um, uh, Adam and I have been working on a record that's kind of been talking about that and kind of what's going on in the world today as well. But um, this is a song um, uh, called Scared I Was. But I'm not 
not scared to stand with you. Where is our humanity? And where is our love? We Thank you so much. Thank you. And now it's time to introduce a really good friend of mine, Mr. Jeff Campbell. Adam Rossi. Italians rule. Hi, everybody. That's one of the best things about playing rock and roll music is you get to say things like, hi, everybody, and then everybody goes. It's a perk of the job. Uh, my name is Jeff Campbell. I'm a, a, a singer-songwriter that's been based here in the Bay Area for about a third of my life, and I've recently relocated back to Philadelphia, where I'm from, to you know en enjoy some of the best things about my incredible hometown. And just being in this room tonight is, is such a reminder of how magical this town and this community and, and the scene here is. And we're all here for one very good reason, because we're here to celebrate Tiffany's fantastic book. So congratulations to Tiffany. <laughs> Thank you so much to Mary for, for being a part of this night and having us. And uh, Jeff's music is, is obviously the, the main thing that brought us all here tonight. And to say that I've spent as much time as I have with these songs and this music over the last several decades of my life, and now I get to stand here with one of my best buds and play this song for you tonight is an honor to say the absolute least. So that, that said, I will say maestro. Should be having his fun 
He's much too blind to see the damage she's done. And sometimes a man must wait to find it. Really, he has no. I wait for you and I'll burn when I ever see your sweet return. And how will I ever learn? Oh, lover, you should have come over. Cause it's not too late. bed is made, the open window lets the rain in. Oh, burning in the cold is the only one that dreams he had you with him. My body turns and it yearns for a sleep that won't Ever come, cause it's never over. My kingdom for a kiss upon his shoulder, and it's never over. My riches for a smile when I step so soft against her, and it's never over. All my blood for the sweetness of a laughter, and it's never over. She's the tear that lies inside my soul forever. Ooh. But maybe I'm just too young. To keep good love from going wrong Ooh. And Oh, love Oh You should have chosen Too young to hold on, but I'm much too old to break free and run. Too deaf, dumb, and blind to see the damage I've done. A sweet lover, you should have come over. Cause it's not too late. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite my friends Rick Munoz and Max Delaney to join my friend Andrew Lyon and myself. She's the tear that hangs inside my soul forever. Just let that one sink in for a minute. Gentlemen, this is a song um, on my last record. Uh, it's called The Movies, and it's unfortunately about someone who is not here to defend themselves, but such is the nature with songwriting in a lot of cases. What did you say? 
I wouldn't do Playing in all those movies with you It's my name up on the marquee after all And the titles can we all just get along kitchen sick I threw it out at you but that doesn't mean what you think it do I'm just saying I tried in all but all wasn't enough it's a shame when all the no ain't stacking up Did you even want the part of Well, you just did to make a say We're all suffering for our own Broken hearts, silver scrape Just see it through. It's not what you think, it's just you being you. It's the way the truth and the light, and it's all in works. And it might be over before it even starts. Just here to make a stand. Oh, we're all suffering for our own. Oh, broken hearts, silver screen. Said you think, but I'm stuck with you. Could wash off your stink if I wanted to. very much. It's a total honor. My name is Jeff Campbell, Max Delaney, Andrew Lyon, and Rick Munoz. Jeff Buckley, Tiffany DiBartolo, Mary Guber, Sweetwater, Mill Valley, California. So much more music coming up. Kyle Nicolatis is up next. Hello. Hello. 
My name is Kyle. Last name, Nicolaitis. You may also know him from his band, Beware of Darkness. I'm going to play some tunes. Up. I'm so nervous. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right. I was like, I'm so sorry. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Listen. I was I was debating coming up here, being like, should I talk before I play, or should I just like try to be cool musician guy? And now it's very apparent I should talk. When <laughs> when um when Scott and Tiffany were like, do you want to play this Jeff Buckley show? I was like fuck yeah I do and then I was like this is sacred ground to me it's like asking a priest like yo do you want to wear Jesus's robe and like do a mass and the priest would be like fuck yeah I want to do that so so um so like grace I think I had it on in my car for probably two years straight and just listened to it nonstop every day and it was that record. And like Jeff, to me, it was like what Jimi Hendrix was to guitar playing. I think Jeff was to singing. Um, so I know I'm not very poetic, but I can come with a witty metaphor every now and then. So <laughs> all right, let me like, f I, I did the cool intro, and I just like wrecked it. So I'll just start the song. <laughs> Why? 
So I was doing research for the show. She already knows the bullshit. She's like, <laughs> I know he's about to be joking. And um, I came across this YouTube video of Brad Pitt talking about how much he loved Jeff Buckley. And I like Brad Pitt. I don't know if you've seen Fight Club. Um, just came out. But Jimmy Page is in the video, and I like Jimmy Page because I'm a huge fan of The Who. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I love Led Zeppelin, and I know Jeff loved Led Zeppelin, so I thought I would do a Led Zeppelin song. Yeah. 
seldom seen The talk of days for which they sit and wait All will be Thank you. Just calling all Waynettes to the stage. Waynettes. People playing with Wayne, where are you? There you are. Where's Jeff? So this next artist needs no introduction. Rolling Stone called him one of the 100 best guitarists to ever live, and The Clash wrote a song about him. And his name is Wayne Kramer. And I shout this out for all the people who make their money by the sweat of their brow, all my blue collar workers, all my hard working laborers. We're gonna make it funky. Put some bass on that for me. One, two, one, two. Put some guitar in there. could talk in the soft white belly of the beast. Dairy Queen madmen chased the girls and muscle cars ruled the streets. 
Back in the day when dogs could talk, we dared to dream of something more. Not a race on the line to punch in time and owe your soul to the company store. Back when dogs could talk. Back when dogs could talk. Back. Rock and roll, laugh till our sides ache at what we saw. Oh, we'd live before we got old. And back in the day when dogs could talk, we dropped plenty acid, listened to Coltrane, pissed off our parents, angered the police with guns and guitars, loud and profane. Back when dogs could talk, back when dogs could talk. Back when dogs could talk Back when dogs could Got his pennies in a bunch as the White Panthers rise to the occasion. Reefer smoking with M1 carbines, black leather jackets and slogans blazing. Not that I want to turn back the clock, back to the day when dogs could talk. Doing righteous work and we cannot be stopped. Back in the day when dogs could talk. Back when dogs could talk. Back when dogs could talk back when dogs could talk back when dogs could talk I shout this out for all the people who make their money by the sweat of their brow all my hard working day laborers all my gardeners all my state and federal employees, all my plumbers, all my carpenters, all my heating and air conditioning men, all my child care workers, all my office workers, all my nursing workers, all my hardworking bartenders and waitresses, all my musicians, all the people who make their money by the sweat of their brow, you have earned the right to be known as the salt of the earth. And I got nothing but love and respect for you. Like Brother Jesse Jackson says, you are somebody. You are somebody. You are somebody. You are somebody. You might be unemployed right now. You are somebody. You might be an addict or alcoholic, but you, you are somebody. You might be temporarily unemployed. You are somebody. Come on, come on. Uh -huh. Oh, somebody. Oh, yeah. You are somebody. You are somebody.
thanks. You know, uh, I knew Tim Buckley, and Tim came to Detroit and played with the MC5, and we happened to play a show in August of 1967, and the next day, the people were so excited about the show that they burned the city down. <laughs> it was called The Rebellion of 1967. We played that Saturday night at the Grandy Ballroom, and the next day we all went out on a picnic together, and people in the neighborhood burned the place. <laughs> so I, I, I am forever connected through Tim, through Jeff, to this day and this night and the celebration of this wonderful book and, and uh, a couple of great artists' efforts. Feeling was mutual. I loved our music too. So the one, the one song that that uh, that I was knocked out that um, Jeff did, it's a very sensitive love ballad that we're going to play for you right now. And it's the kind of thing that when you're alone with your lover and lights are low and you could get lucky, and you reach out and you say, "Baby, right now it's time to." Said, right now is time to yeah. say it, say it. Right now is time to kick off the jams, motherfucker.
hope. Are you ready? Dan, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Wow, thank you guys so much. We have one more number for you. Special treat. There was a secret call that David played, and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? Well, it goes like this the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lips, the bathroom king composing. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Faith was strong when you needed proof. Saw a bathing on the roof, a beauty and the moonlight. Tied you to a kitchen chair She broke your throne She cut your hair And from her lips She drew a hallelujah
Maybe there's a God above But all I've ever learned from love Was how to shoot somebody who outdrew ya It's not a cry you hear at night It's not somebody who's seen the light It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you guys all for a fantastic night. Thank you all again for coming. Uh, that was fucking amazing, if I don't say so myself. These guys were insane. Um, Tiffany will be signing books outside. Uh, have a good evening. Be safe driving home. Thank you so much for listening or watching. We hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did. And be sure to follow Bright Antenna on YouTube or Cocktails with Bright Antenna on your favorite podcast network because we have a lot more great episodes in the works. Leave your comments down below. Be sure to check out that lilac margarita recipe in the information section. Until next time, remember, music is not a pastime. It's a necessity.